Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again. It's Wednesday, midweek Wednesday. Happy Hump Day. Uh, got a few things to talk about today. Some tool related, some not. I thought we'd have a little fun today. First of all, a couple comments. Uh, first off, let's get to Scott Darling. Uh, asked about my uh, typical bird feeder. Uh, what do I do for feeding the birds? And you know, I don't have a lot of bird feeders out there. I just got that one bird table we made here on the channel a while ago. But one thing I really do enjoy is during the uh, cold winter months, and especially during the snow, is to make sure my birds get enough uh, food and water. But uh, you could see here, I'm the only one on the block. I have a neighbor two, uh, two houses down that uh, is good too with feeding the birds. But you could see they all know where to get their food. And, and when it snows, they come to my house and they cover the lawn. It's such a beautiful sight to see. And, and they reward me all summer long with their beautiful songs. And it's just a real pleasure. So uh, if you know what I'm talking about, I remember my grandmother years ago and, and all the women on the block, especially the old Italian ladies and the old immigrants, the ladies that came from Europe and stuff, they would always at night to rip up some bread and throw it out in the backyard. I mean, everybody took joy in having birds around their house. And, you know, today, I don't know what the difference is. You know, today, I, I, I tell you, I don't see too many around me. Old timers do. But, you know, the new people, I guess they just take it for granted that the birds are there. But uh, that's what I do, Scott. So I have that one thing and I put my suet blocks in there and also some bird seeds. So they really get a uh, a good feeding whenever it's especially when it snows. Next up a friend of the show by the name of Larry Tomlinson had uh, asked a couple people asked this but he was the first one to ask and he's uh, when we did this hammer the other day the uh, the copper hammer he says how come you didn't just put it in the lathe and face it off and let me tell you that's a fantastic question I'm so glad you asked because uh, that would be something that would be fun to do but let me just uh, explain a couple things about copper. Now, what Larry and a lot of you wanted to know is when we were working on this hammer, why didn't I just take this and put it into the lathe and turn it and then just, uh, I could face this off, I could make this all nice. It's because, first of all, there's two reasons. Number one, when you're working on copper, it's a whole different animal, and we'll get to that in a minute. But here, when you can see here, this hammerhead, now the way it's shaped, um, I don't have a big lathe, uh, but to get this, this is a, over an inch, about an inch and a half. So you would need a very, a, kind of a big lathe to be able to get this far enough into the chuck that you would hold it here. Me, I would only be able to hold it about here. So that means I'd have this much overhang. And when you have that much overhang, it's very susceptible to grabbing with copper. Now, copper, when we deal with copper, or we, we deal with brass, or we deal with aluminum, or any other type of metal, they all have different characteristics. And co anything with copper, which means brass, brass is an alloy of, of copper and zinc, and uh, also bronze, or anything that has copper in it, this is dangerous stuff to deal with. If you're going to drill it, solid copper i'm showing your tube now but if you're going to drill it if you're going to turn on the lathe or anything because your tools have to be ground specifically and my tools are mostly ground for aluminum and for some steel but when you're going to start dealing with the uh, copper you have to you have to start changing your whole tool geometry let me show you now i, I was mean. so happy when you guys asked that question about uh, turning on the lathe because it means you know not only you're watching the channel but it also means that you know you're thinking ahead but here is when I say tool, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a cutter of any type. Now, in a lathe, it would be a, uh, a high speed steel cutter, or whatever, but, uh, this is a drill bit, which we all, you know, use either in a hand drill or a drill press. And a drill bit is amazing with the, uh, how this is made up. I mean, there's so many things you could learn about a drill bit, you know, between the, tw the flutes, the twist and the rake and the angle of the drill bit, you know, there's, there's hundreds of things to know about. We, we buy drill bits at the store and we just, you know, chuck them in. Usually they come with 118 degree, if you look up here, 118 degree angle is the standard uh, drill bit that you'll buy for general use. But they also come in uh, steeper and less steep angles. And they even come, some come almost uh, flat across. The now top. here's an example of uh, what would be flat across the top. This is a, a milling, you can see here, this is flat across. And this is would be considered a milling uh, bit that you put in a milling machine. Again, with the flutes here and the number of flutes. This here is a, a two flute 
uh, bit. Now, if obviously, if it was, uh, if the angle was like this, it would be a 90 degree angle. You could see that's a 90 degree. It would be 90 degree if the drill point was like this. So when you're dealing with a basic 118 degree, you could see here the difference between that and a 90 degree. And obviously the more it flattens out, the uh, the, the higher degree it would be. So uh, depending on what you're using to cut, to drill into, you want to have two things you have to think about. Number uh, one is the angle the ang the geometry of the point of the bit and also the rake and this is what we're going to talk about now, now here is your drill bit here and here's the cutting edge okay see this here there's two cutting edges on a drill bit and then the flutes allow the material to pass through now they do make straight flutes where this is a twisted flute drill bit which we're most used to but the old-fashioned they used to have straight flute drill bits which are really good for cutting anything with copper in it because it doesn't grab however now here is the rake. Now if you look here at the cutting angle, you see here the angle between this point here, between the helix and between the cutting edge right here, that angle right there is called the rake. Now that's meant to cut into the wood. Now if you want to use this drill bit for brass, plastic, or any other lead, things like that, you want to make this a zero right now this angle here whatever this angle is is too sharp you want to dull that out and make this into a uh, it would only be good for cutting brass and plastic things like that it would no longer be good for cutting steel and whatnot because you got rid of the rake but that's really important let me show you how important okay it is. now we're over here at the drill press this is a regular piece of uh of plastic here we're going to drill through it here this is a non-modified bit just like you might come to the drill press hold it down with your hand we got a back of board now what i'm going to use instead of my hand i'm going to put a piece of wood here just because i don't want my hand getting because i know it could happen in here so we're going to drill through this and see what happens okay now i want you to look what happened you see there the flutes caught dug into the plastic whipped it around and this is why see right there that's it and it's no secret to me because this is a, a common this can happen with sheet metal can happen with a lot of things and I'm going to show you what we're going to do to prevent that now you, that will happen five out of five times you might get lucky in a blue moon it might go through but I'm telling you this is an injury waiting to happen plastic uh brass copper Lead, they all react the same way. They dig in, they grab, and they'll spin it around, and it will do damage to you. It will kill you. But uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to modify that bit, and I'm going to show now, you what how. we're going to do is we're going to dull out this sharp edge here and make it look like this. See how we flattened that out like that? We're basically going to dull out this drill bit, but I'm going to show you the difference when we uh, drill. So let me go show you how we're going to dull that Now, out. you can use any kind of stone or whatever for this operation. I'm going to use the Dremel. And what we're going to do is we're going to touch this, make this a zero. We're going to get rid of that sharp edge here by touching this to this when it's on. Okay, so what we did here, there we go, we're focused. We, now we took the edge here. You can see we flattened it out on that side, flattened it out on this side here. We dulled it. There's no more. Now the angle is zero. Remember, it used to be sharp. Now it's zero. Let's try it on a piece of plastic and okay. see what happens. Same piece of plastic here. We're going to drill over a little bit here. Again, we're going to hold it down here like this. And I'm just going to show you the difference now in what happens. Pretty uneventful, right? And uh, and look at the hole now. You got a nice hole because it's kind of scraped its way through. See that here? We could do this now. Now you don't have to worry because now you have a bit that's meant to cut through plastic. There we go. Nice clean hole with a regular bit. Now look how nice and clean those holes are, right? Compared to uh, what could have been here and the damage that could have been done with this. So it might be worth it if you're going to be drilling through plastic, 
through copper or any alloy with copper because copper grabs the same way uh, to modify your drill bits. Good machinists will have a whole set of drill bits just made for brass and copper and, and uh, materials like that. So hope that helps. You know, uh, speaking of copper, you know, as uh, growing up, I was big into coins and, and I told you about that. Well, do you know the United States currency, especially the coins, where uh, the value of the coin was always in precious metal? So uh, you had uh, our early silver coins were made from real silver and the pennies before 1982 were made from 95 percent copper. So uh, it, the value of the coin rested in the precious metal that it was made from. Uh, now it's totally different. Now a, a modern coin is 97% zinc with a, uh, <laughs> a copper coating. So, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's backed like our money. Our money used to be backed by gold and now it's backed by who knows what. They print it up as they think they need it. And if you don't think that's going to be a problem years from now, uh, <laughs> I think it will be. But anyway, talking about copper pennies, let's go check this out. I think you'll find it interesting. Now, here is a modern, very modern, 2020 penny. And you can see here that what the front and back have. But uh, years ago, they were a little bit different. Now, this is identical in size and shape to the original penny, but the uh, just the makeup of what it is is different. Now, now, years ago, I picked up a bunch of rolls of pennies from a friend of mine that was a collector. And he said, save these one day. And I figured one day I, this is... And, and this is one of these rolls that was never opened from years ago. Got to be 60, 60, 70 years old. Now, you can see here, the, the date on that coin is, what is that? 1919, right? So, let's open this up. What do you say? We open this up, see what's in here. You never know. Maybe there's my, the coin 1909 SVDB. And uh, that's an interesting coin. We'll talk about that. But this is all coins from back. Never to be seen before. <laughs> Look at these. All these old pennies. Who knows? It could be, and you can tell the older pennies because on the back here, you see it says that's a, we call these Wheaties because they have two wheat stalks on each side of the one cent. And, uh, and again, you could tell the date and the condition, uh, every one of these. I'll go through them, but it's pretty interesting here. All these coins never seen light for 50 or 60 years. And here they are in their glory. These are old oh, copper coins. I had coins. to get my OptiVisor. These things are great. If you don't have one, you need to get one. This one here is the original one, uh, OptiVisor. And the number four is the power you want. It's fantastic. I learned that from Mr. Pete. Anyway, uh, laid them out here. Some interesting. You know what's always funny when you look at these coins? You think about the history they went through. 1909, they, they started producing the Lincoln Cent. And uh, my earliest one from this roll goes back to 1910. You can see there we have a 1910. And then from there, you know, I just separated that they go up a little bit. And uh, you can see here the years, you know, as they go and by. Uh, 19, a lot of 1919 pennies. If you see a small letter underneath, you know, that's uh, like there. You see a, a 1990 D. That's a Denver Mint or S would be San Francisco. And uh, over here, the stock market crashes. It's so funny because the pennies were a lot more worn during the years of the stock market crash because, you know. But here we're getting into the 30s. Here's 1937. That's when the Hindenburg went down. It's amazing, isn't it? When you think about the life, what these pennies have seen. Today, pennies are considered a nuisance in your pocket, but years ago, everybody had pennies in their pocket because you could still use them for purchases, where today, really, you, you don't use them too much. You never know what, what history is behind some of these. And it goes up to, you know, the war pennies here. I remember as a kid looking for the 40s, if you find a, a war penny from 1943 in copper, that's big money. Big money, thousands and thousands of dollars. But pretty interesting. These go up to 1956 uh, or so. So nothing after 56. So pretty interesting. There's a lot of history in there. And uh, it's always a lot of fun to search through. I, I love so that closing, stuff. Don't forget, we have the uh, Scout Crafted Tool Toe Challenge due this week. And uh, that'll be uh, Sunday. I need them by 6 o'clock. Don't send any photos after that. They won't get into the video. And also... Um, Monday's the deadline, so I hope you're having a good time doing this. Uh, my whole basement smells like varnish. I haven't had that in a while because I usually have been using shellac for a while. And 
I went back to varnish for this project, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's all done. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I hope you are too. And um, I hope you have a great day. Take care now. Bye-bye. <laughs>